Guys, how's it going today? Sorry for the short delay. A couple minutes there, but let's get started. Oops. How's everyone doing this fine morning? Sorry for the sad look on my face. That would be because I am tired. Alright, so anyways guys, welcome. This is going to be called... What did I call it? Yoroshi Story Time, that's right. Where we take about an hour or so to read from a book that has to do with gaming culture. Today's book, or this, this time period's book, is... Um... What's up, Moulton? This time period's book is Ready Player One by... Ernest Klein. And, um, I'm not really going to be paying a lot of attention to chat. Sorry, because I'd like to get deep into the book. We're going to start right off the bat. So anyone here today isn't missing a thing. Um, and so we're going to get right into it because I am running a little late and I know that there's not a lot of people in the channel. So anyone who is here, it's only going to go for about an hour or so. I don't want to take up too many people's time, but the whole concept of this uh, Sunday thing is is because there's so much more to the gaming culture than just gaming. Twitch is a perfect example of that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna get into it with um, some books too. There's been some wonderful books written based around the whole gaming culture and industry and everything like that. Um, this one's got great pop culture references to a time period that I'm a fan of. Um, so we will be. We'll be enjoying that as well. So grab a cup of coffee, get your breakfast, whatever you need to do. Sit down. Let's enjoy this. And um, am I dropping frames or is that you sleep? It's probably me. Okay. All right, guys. So let's get started right off the bat. <coughs> Let me get the music. That's gonna be. No, uh, I wanted to have a little light music. We can make that happen. I just gotta do it. There we go. Just something in the background to keep you guys focused. All right, so we're gonna start from the back cover. There's just a quick little excerpt in the back here. Um, it's got some great reviews and everything like that. Um, in the year 2044, reality is an ugly place. The only time teenage Wade Watt really feels alive is when he's jacked into the virtual utopia known as the Oasis. Wade de Wade's devoted his life to studying the puzzles hidden within the world's digital confines Puzzles that are based on the creator's obsession with the pulp culture of the decades past and that promise massive power Massive power and Computer needs to stop interrupting me Massive power and fortune for whoever can unlock them But when Wade stumbles upon the first clue he finds himself beset by players willing to kill to take this ultimate prize. The race is on, and if Wade's going to survive, he'll have to win. And confront the real world he's always been so desperate to escape. Everyone my age remembers where they were and what they were doing when they first heard about the contest. I was sitting in my hideout watching cartoons when the news bulletin broke into my video feed, announcing that James Halliday had died during the night. I'd heard of Halliday, of course. Everyone had. He was the video game designer responsible for creating The Oasis, a massive multiplayer online game that had gradually evolved into 
the globally networked virtual success of a um, virtual reality most of humanity now used on a daily basis. The unprecedented success of the Oasis had made Halliday one of the wealthiest people in the world. At first, I couldn't understand why the media was making such a big deal of the billionaire's death. After all, the people on, of planet Earth had other concerns. The ongoing energy crisis, catastrophic climate change, widespread famine, poverty, and disease. Half a dozen wars. You know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Normally the news feeds didn't interrupt everyone's interactive sitcoms and soap operas unless something really major had happened. Like the outbreak of some new killer virus or another major city vanishing in a cloud of mushroom. Big stuff like that. As famous as he was, Halliday's death should have warranted only a brief segment on the evening news. So the unwashed... <clears throat> so the unwashed masses rented only a only a brief segment of the unmasked masses could shake their heads in envy when the newscasters announced the obscenely large amount of money that would be doled out to the rich man's heirs. But that was the rub. James Halliday had no heirs. He had died a 67-year-old bachelor with no living relatives and by most accounts without a single friend. He'd spent the last 15 years of his life in self-imposed isolation, during which time, if the rumors were to be believed, he had gone completely insane. So the real jaw-dropping news that January morning, the news that had everyone from Toronto to Tokyo crapping in their cornflakes concerned the contents of Halliday's last will and testament and the fate of his fortune. Halliday had prepared a short video message along with instructions that it, it be released to the world media at the time of his death. He had also arranged to have a copy of the video emailed to every single Oasis user that same morning. I still remember hearing the familiar uh, electronic chime when it arrived in my inbox, just a few seconds after I saw the first news bulletin. His video message was actually a meticulously constructed short film titled Anorox Invitation was crammed with obscure 80s pop culture references, nearly all of which were lost on me the first time I reviewed it. The entire video was just over five minutes in length, and in the days and weeks that followed, it would become the most scrutinized piece of film in history. Surpassing even the Zapruder film in the amount of painstaking frame by frame analysis devoted to it, my entire generation would come to know every second of Halliday's message by heart. Anorex Invitation begins with the sound of trumpets opening on an old song called Dead Man's Party. The song plays over a dark screen for a few seconds until the until the trumpets are joined by a guitar and that's when Halliday appears but he's not 67 he's not a 67 year old man ravaged by time and illness he looks just like he did on the cover of Time magazine back in 2014 a tall thin healthy man in his early 40s with unkempt hair and his trademark horn-rimmed eyeglasses. He's also wearing the same clothing he wore in the Time cover photo. Faded jeans and vintage Space Invaders t-shirt. Halliday is at a high school dance being held in a large gymnasium. He is surrounded by teenagers whose clothing, hairstyles, and dance moves 
all indicate that the time period is the late 80s. Halliday is dancing too, something no one ever saw him do in real life. Grinning maniacally, he spins in rapid circles, swinging his arms and head in time with the song, flawlessly cycling through several signature 80s dance moves. But Halliday has no dance partner. He is, as the saying goes, dancing with himself. A few lines of text appear briefly at the lower left-hand corner of the screen, listing the name of the band, the song title, and the record label, and the year of the release, as if this were an old music video airing on MTV. Oingo Boingo, Dead Man's Party, MCA Records, 1985. When the lyrics kick in, Halliday begins to limp sync along, still gyrating, all dressed up with nowhere to go, walking with a dead man over my shoulder, don't run away, it's only me. He abruptly stops dancing and makes a cutting motion with his right hand silencing the music. At the same moment, the dancers and gymnasium behind him vanish. And the scene around him suddenly changes, Halliday now stands in front of a funeral parlor next to an open casket. A second, much older Halliday lies inside the casket, his body emaciated and ravaged by cancer. Shiny quarters cover each of his eyelids. The younger Halliday gazes down at the corpse of his older self with mock sadness, then turns to address the assembled mourners. Halliday snaps his fingers and a scroll appears in his right hand. He opens it with a flourish and, unf- and it unfurls into the fo- floor. Well, that's a lot of Fs. <laughs> Unraveling down the aisle in front of him, he breaks the fourth wall, addressing the viewer, and begins to read I, James Donovan Halliday, being of sound mind and disposing memory, do hereby make, publish, and declare this instrument to be my last will and testament, hereby revoking any and all wills and codicils by me. At any time henceforth they're made. He continues reading faster and faster, plowing through several paragraphs of legalese until he's speaking so rapidly that the words are unintelligible. Then he stops abruptly. Forget it, he says. Even at that speed, it would take me a month to read the whole thing. Said to say, I don't have that kind of time. He drops the scroll and it vanishes in a shower of golden dust. Let me just give you the highlights. The funeral parlor vanishes, and the scene changes once again. Halliday now stands in front of an immense bank vault door. My entire estate, including a controlling share of stock in my company, gregarious simulation systems, is to be placed in escrow until such time as a single condition I have set forth in my will is met. The first individual to meet that condition will inherit my entire fortune, currently valued in excess of $240 billion. The vault door swings open and Halliday walks inside. The interior of the vault is enormous and is, and it contains huge stacks of gold bars, roughly the size of a large house. Here's the dough. I'm putting it up for grabs, Halliday says, grinning broadly. What the hell? You can't take it with you, right? Halliday leans against a sack of gold bars, and the camera...